So if you remember, um, we had defined this notion of a canonical DR plan. Um, and the idea is that by giving a structural property of the DR plan, and but first of all, maybe you don't remember what a DR plan is. I talked about it in my workshop talk and also before, but uh, we can just quickly go over it. So a DR plan, if you remember, is motivated by uh, giving a combinatorial plan for how to recursively decompose a graph into rigid subgraphs in order to uh, re in reverse um, uh, solve uh, the polynomial system that corresponds to the original distance constraint system. <clears throat> so we're primarily uh, restricting ourselves to distance constraint systems at this time, uh, but the notion of DR plan is in general uh, applicable to any kind of constraint system uh, where um, you know there's some underlying abstract rigidity matroid um, that you can define <clears throat> and a notion of rigidity as corresponding to having finitely many solutions to the corresponding polynomial system. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, you, we are simulating this notion of triangularization of a polynomial system where at any given time uh, of the solution process, you have finitely many solutions so that you can uh, pick one of them, let's say, for each one of the subsystems and uh, solve the larger system by substituting those values and thereby getting a smaller algebraic system. So, and the goal is to minimize the size of the algebraic system, some algebraic complexity measures, including degree, number of variables, and so on, of the algebraic system that you solve at any given time. And a rough measure of that is what we call the fan in of this DR plan. Uh, which is uh, which is something that is uh, defined just on the graph. Okay, so that's the introduction uh, to the motivation for DR plan recollection. So now we uh, define the DR plan is of any constraint graph, and as I said, we're going to just talk about uh, distance constraint graphs at this time. Um, um, and it's a forest where each node is a rigid subgraph of G. Uh, a uh, root node is a maximal rigid subgraph, an internal node is a union of its children, and a leaf node is a single constraint and the involved primitives. We are also going to assume, he, you know, with almost no exceptions, that when we say subgraph, we mean induced subgraph, right? Vertex induced subgraph. So the definition of a canonical, so this is a very general thing, it doesn't say much about. Um, um, much about whether these rigid subgraphs are in any way maximal, uh, proper maximal rigid subgraphs of the graph uh, or anything like that. Now there's a definition of a complete DR plan that's sort of in between this and the canonical DR plan, which actually forces these rigid subgraphs to actually be maximal, uh, what we call rumps or rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs. But uh, we can skip that and just directly include that into the definition of the DR plan. Uh, I mean, canonical DR plan. So canonical DR plan is one in which the children are rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs of the parent graph. Um, besides being having the properties of a DR plan, it has these two additional properties. Um, if all pairs of uh, rumps intersect trivially, then all of them are children. Otherwise, exactly two that intersect non-trivially are children. So in other words, if you um, if you think about the DR plan itself and you look at a node and you look at its children, there are only two cases. This is written in a, in a funny way, but there are only two cases. Either all of them pairwise intersect trivially or there are exactly two and they intersect non-trivially. And if you remember non-trivially simply means that the size of the intersection uh, is that so there's an underlying abstract rigidity matroid, let's say of dimension D and uh, their intersection is um, at least D plus one, that's non-trivial. So, um, so in, in the case of D equals two, for example, we ex uh, the trivial intersection means they intersect on a vertex. And in the case of D equals three, trivial intersection would be that they intersect either on a vertex or on an edge 
So, or, or, or on a pair of vertices, right? So, um, uh, canonical. So, the theorem that we're going to prove, start proving today, um, is basically that a canonical DR plan exists for any graph. First of all, because you know it's not quite clear that you can actually find a canonical DR plan. That, especially the property two, seems like, you know, why should that be the case? You know, why should it be that? One, it's almost like a, a statement rather than a part of a definition, but it turns out to be essentially some well-defined, you know. Um, so, so show that it exists for a graph and any canonical DR plan is optimal if the graph is independent. And again, independent in the abstract rigidity matrix. Okay. So um, the proof is uh, uses um, two simple, uh, sort of, we call it observations and lemma, and and you know the lemma happens to have a lot of cases, but um, uh, probably there's a simpler proof of the lemma. But the the way it's written right now, in uh, by the way, I put the references somewhere. You, if you look through the slides, which is posted on Piazza always, make a copy of the slides that I'm presenting and post them on Piazza. The link to the copy will keep changing, so you if you have your browser on a particular link, you might have to refresh that. So this was the list of um, papers. And I think I collected a set of links, which I will update this by, with the links, but we are primarily talking about this paper right now. Sorry, shouldn't have done that. So the, this optimal decomposition paper, which is uh, by three of my grad students and myself from 2015. Okay, so um, where are we? Proof, yeah. Okay, so it uh, relies on two simple observations. Um, remember, I'm using the word isostatic here. The isostatic is used in that proof because some applications to materials is given, but isostatic just it means minimally rigid. So uh, there are two, there's a simple observation and a simple lemma on which the proof of the uh, theorem is based. And uh, it's a good uh, homework exercise to actually prove these things. But I will actually, maybe for today, since we're just warming up back into the system, uh, I can just try to prove this. So the first is this observation. I think the next one slide actually has the observation there. Okay, good. So if um, two uh, subgraphs are minimally rigid, uh, uh, sorry, I think something is missing. Uh, an assumption that was made. Um, okay, so yeah, there was an assumption in the paper which is missing. I should have put it there. So we, we assume that the graph is independent. Throughout the paper, uh, the original graph that we're starting out is independent because we uh, the theorem only holds, this theorem only holds if the graph is independent. So we're gonna assume that the graph is independent and uh, although it's not stated explicitly in the observation in the lemma, it's that graph that we're thinking about always. So um, these are all part of the proof of the uh, theorem. So it's not explicitly stated that the graph is independent except in the statement of the theorem. So in this observation, you should include in it that we know that the graph that um, we're starting out with is in fact independent in whatever the derigidity matroid is. So, um, so we, we sometimes write it, I mean, at least this may be written as though the dimension is two, but you will see that most of this simply relates to counting and nothing else really, because we are starting out with an assumption of uh, independence. Uh, and so it, it, a good chunk of it actually goes through, almost all of it goes through for any, uh, the, the result goes through, but the proofs also go through um, uh, the way they are written for uh, other dimensions. So this is saying, and it's a good homework uh, to think about this because this is, um, we're making certain assumptions that allow us to uh, deal with things ju using just counting. Uh, so we're um, as assuming that the graph is independent in the rigidity matroid and that the Fi and Fj are non-empty minimally rigid subgraphs of that graph. Right, so um, we from that we're going to conclude uh, that the union 
of the two graphs. Um, so I guess we're also, uh, because if you have a trivial graph, so for example, in, in the case of uh, D equals two, a trivial graph is a single vertex and the single vertex is, you know, by count, uh, by the counting thing, it would be um, uh, over constrained because it's got two degrees of freedom, but you need at least three degrees of freedom for it to be uh, minimally rigid, so to speak. Okay, so um, so we can assume we can essentially conclude that if they are non-empty isostatic graphs, and by minimally rigid we say that it's independent, uh, and um, it, for it to be meaningful, even we're just uh, can assume that F i union F j is not trivial. Under constraint simply means that it is um, everything is independent, so we, we never think about any dependent edges at all. So under constraint here simply means uh, that um, there are fewer edges than are necessary to um, make it mean, uh, make it rigid. Okay, so Fi union Fj is under constraint if and only if Fi intersect Fj is trivial and Fi union Fj is, is minimally rigid if and only if Fi intersect Fj is minimally rigid. And uh, finally, that we can conclude that Fi intersect Fj is not under constrained. It, I mean, is not the it is not the case that it has fewer edges than is required to be minimally rigid. The reason being that if it if it were, then their union, uh, the 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 number of degrees of freedom of the union would uh, contradict the fact that the original graph is independent. Okay, so. Um, you can look, uh, so, so for the first one, so the proof, we can simply go through the proof. Note that if Fi union Fj are trivial, then uh, Fi and Fj must also be trivial. And we have, as I said, in the rest of the paper, sort of ruled out uh, an isostatic graph from being trivial simply from the, the counts. Um, so if you look at an edge in two dimensions, three dimensions, for example, it's got uh, three plus three minus uh, one, which, appears to indicate that it is uh, over constrained because it's got five degrees of freedom, it should have six. Um, so we're just ruling those things up. So for the next, so the first statement is actually simply in a way uh, ruling things out uh, from being called, uh, from calling them iso uh, minimally rigid because they're trivial. Okay, for the next part, um, we simply use, so Fi union Fj, is under constraint, which means it doesn't have enough edges to be rigid, if and only if the intersection is uh, trivial because we know that it, the intersection cannot be um, over constrained. So it, it cannot have more edges than um, what is required to be rigid because then it would have been dependent. And we know it's not, uh, there's no dependent uh, edge here. So the only other option, uh, would be that it is trivial. So that's the second part. So we don't need this 2V and all this 2V. I mean, because the rest of the paper, I just cut and paste from the paper and the paper is sort of assuming certain things. Um, and then Fi union Fj is minimally rigid if and only if the intersection is minimally rigid. Uh, again, you can uh, conclude that uh, the intersection, if we know that the intersection is not, uh, doesn't have more edges than um, required, so it must have, the, and there are no dependent edges whatsoever. So the only option is for it to be exactly minimally rigid uh, for for the, so just do an inclusion exclusion count of the degrees of freedom, this plus this minus that to get the degrees of freedom of the whole thing. And then the last thing is it is not, uh, their intersection cannot be under constraint. As I said, if it had been, again, from the exclusion count, it would follow that the, it would contradict the fact that the whole thing uh, is not, doesn't have any over constraints. So um, this fall, the, so the observation is a simple uh, exercise of just counting uh, with the assumption that we know that the graph is independent. And then the lemma uh, has, as I said, quite a few more cases and um, depends on the fact of, uh, depends on certain properties of the canonical DR plan. So we will look at that. Um, it, it's good to remember the lemma because we're going to be using it in the proof. Uh, but uh, the proof of it, proof of the lemma, 
we'll put aside for later, if at all. Okay, so, but you can look at the paper. Uh, it's in the appendix, the proof, because it's got all these cases. Okay, so um, if it is that, if it is, uh, the lemma is saying that if a node is a, um, uh, I mean, it is, we don't, I don't have to necessarily say here that it's isostatic node of the canonical DR plan because there is no other um, possibility because we're assuming that the graph is independent. Uh, so if it's a minimum, and we know that the nodes have to be rigid, so it automatically means it's minimally rigid um, of, a, of a canonical DR plan. And the canonical DR plan, remember, has these two properties, um, two, two extra properties of having rumps as children at every node and uh, either all pairs of children have trivial intersections or there are exactly two of them, the non-trivial intersection. So if it has these distinct children and then we can uh, say some things to some extent following from these properties of maximality, the vertex maximality and to some extent from this observation that uh, the, pair, the union is isostatic if and only if the pair, the union is everything, right? Uh, and uh, and if you have uh, if if something is isostatic, then for every uh, so if any pair of them, the union of any pair of them is isostatic, then um, for every um, for every um, sort of, sort of other possible pairing with I, that's also isostatic. So uh, alternatively, if the pair is isostatic, then um, all of them will be. So, so every union, every pairwise union also turns out to be the whole thing. And then if, um, so in, in a way, one, two, and three, two, two uh, sort of um, is used in the proof of one, but we're just stating it as three different things so that um, because we use them independently uh, in the proof. So, and if, um, the intersection is trivial, then for, if the intersection of any pair is trivial, then for every pair intersection is trivial. So, okay. So uh, this is in a way uh, saying that the definition of the DR plan is well, the canonical DR plan is well-defined or in other words, is saying that such a DR, canonical DR plan exists, right? So for the graph. So um, now we can sort of um, proceed to the proof of the theorem. Um, it's 1052. Mm. Yeah, I think I can give the overall uh, pattern of the proof or how the proof goes. And then we can go into the details of the different claims and so forth after a recap on Tuesday. Okay, so we, we can show the existence of a canonical DR plan by constructing it in this way. So you begin with the complete DR plan of G. And then remember the complete DR plan doesn't have this extra condition, which, which uh, the second condition of the canonical DR plan, it just has the first one. And um, it doesn't, and therefore, you know, the existence of it is not something to be actually shown. So um, the, this is, it always exists. So uh, right now we're primarily talking about the second part. So, um, so this is saying that if you start with the complete DR plan of G um, uh, and, and what you do is you modify the complete DR plan to make it canonical, right? So uh, can, complete DR plan already always exists and complete DR plan, like I said, is just the first part, not the second. Um, and it always exists and you, for every node with children C1 through Cn, you retain only those nodes according to the following rules. If their intersection is trivial, then retain all of them, right? Uh, uh, if the intersection is rigid, then select any two out of its children and retain them, okay? So, um, and then we can show that this satisfies uh, properties two and three of the canonical DR plan, you know, uh, so, oh, what is three? I think this was two and three, okay. Um, uh, because all of the nodes in the uh, complete DR plan are rigid vertex maximal proper subgraph. And instead of saying rumps, we're starting to use clusters. And to show that property one holds, 
uh, that this is a DR plan at all. So I guess this was written as one and two, but in fact, one is the fact that it's a DR plan at all. Uh, for the first case, which is that if their intersection is trivial, then retain all as children. We can start with a complete, um, because we are starting with a complete DR plan, if we preserve all the children, uh, it is still a DR plan because the union, their union gives the whole thing. That's one of the property, the, the union of the children gives the parent. That's one of the properties of the DR plan. And in the second case, we know that the union must be rigid as well. And since it cannot be anything other than uh, the, the C itself from the lemma, uh, we would have uh, from the lemma. So this would mean that we would have found a larger rigid proper subgraph of C contradicting the vertex maximality. So, uh, so essentially the, the, the existence or the second property follows from the vertex maximality of the first, uh, because if you um, cannot find something, um, uh, you know, if their union cannot be anything other than C, uh, then, you know, this would, they would have to be, uh, you know, you cannot have yet another one. So in other words, the, the, just a pair of them should be sufficient because otherwise you would have found a larger proper subgraph of C, which would contradict vert uh, uh, vertex maximality. So, so now if we begin with a minimally rigid graph, uh, you can then, you know, everywhere when we talk about rigid, we can only, uh, you know, sort of relax it or just instead replace it by just minimally rigid throughout the construction and then observe all of these properties. Okay. so. So essentially this just says that um, because of the vertex maximality and because of the lemma, um, we can essentially conclude, and the, the key part of the lemma that we care about is that in fact, uh, you know, the, the, this is isostatic if and only if the union of them is all of the graph, right? So that's the part of the lemma that we're actually using. So because of that, and because of the rigid vertex maximality, we can uh, use this way of uh, taking a complete DR plan, which means it satisfies the first property of having vertex maximal rigid subgraphs, and then ensure the second property. Start with this and ensure the second. Okay. Um, so that's the um, that's the first part to show that it exists. Uh, the second part is to show that it's optimal. That a canonical DR plan is optimal. By optimal, what do we mean? We mean that it um, it has the best fan in or the smallest maximum fan in among all DR plans. So we're maximizing overall the nodes of the DR plan and any DR plan, not necessarily complete, not necessarily canonical, nothing, right? So canonical DR plan is the optimal one as far as minimizing the maximum fan in uh, over all DR plans. So that's what we're trying to show. So, uh, so uh, the way we show this is by induction. Uh, well, there are a few notes here, but since we have, we're almost three minutes. Okay, let's quickly go through it. So first to note that any DR plan R without the property two of a canonical DR plan can always be modified by introducing inter intermediate nodes to satisfy property two. This is simply saying that you can always get a, uh, a complete DR plan without increasing the maximum fan. And since any, you know, so do add, putting maximal ones um, there will only decrease the fan in, not increase the fan. Uh, especially because we have this property that if there is any non-trivial intersection, you only put exactly two of them. So um, since any rigid proper subgraph of C uh, is the subgraph of some rigid proper subgraph of C. Okay, so this is kind of obvious if you think about it. So then we can. Um, without loss of generality, assume that the optimal DR plan satisfies the completeness condition, which is that all the subset, I mean, subgraphs are in fact drums. So the proof of the optimality, so one direction, so in other words, every uh, um, optimal DR plan must satisfy one of the properties of the canonical DR plan. So the proof of optimality of the canonical DR plan is by induction on the height. So we're gonna look at the height of this DR plan. Uh, 
And uh, the base case is when the height is zero for single edges. The induction hypothesis is the canonical DR plans of height T are optimal for the root node. And then for the induction step, we consider a canonical DR plan of height T plus one rooted at a given node. And you assume that uh, the canonical DR plans for all the children, of, I mean, for all the descendant nodes, in fact. So then from the induction hypothesis, we know that um, RCI would then be optimal for CI. So it's sufficient to demonstrate that a set of nodes must represent S that must be present in any DR plan R for C that satisfies the, you know, the second property, um, um, uh, including a non-optimal one. So in other words, um, we, we sort of construct or show or illustrate a set of nodes that must be present in every DR plan that satisfies the second property. And secondly, for any such DR plan that uh, contains such a set of nodes, the, the set that, that sort of important or that set that's always present, S must be the set of children of C or for all the ancestors A of S, R has the minimum possible fan in of two. Okay, so you can never get better than fan in of two. So because you can't get better than fan in of two, adding a node into the DR plan with fan in of two is not gonna change anything, right? So, um, so that's, um, that's the overall plan of the proof. So <clears throat> the rest of the proof, I mean, it's an interesting kind of proof. The, but to me, I have, you know, took a while for us to come up with this idea of this important set of nodes that must be present in every DR plan that has these basic properties, right? So, and that sort of was the key because for a while we were scratching our head, how on earth do we show that this, this particular DR plan uh, is optimal? And, um, and this sort of ensured that, you know, you didn't have crazy DR plans that you would have to compare against. This is ensuring that every DR plan has to have this set of nodes. And so now we can concentrate only on those DR plans. So that was the plan and then we can, Continue with the proof in the next, um, on Tuesday.